Today we have uh, Shilpa Gore and uh, Pinky Shah with us. I'll just briefly introduce them. Shilpa Gore Shah and Pinky Shah are founding partners and design principals of S and P PS Architects, which they jointly founded in 1997. They are engaged in the study, reflection, and practice of design, architecture, and urbanism. Their design approach is that every project is unique and that the design should evolve through the particular characteristics of each project. Their work is influenced by their interest in history, pedagogy, travel, and common sense. The various national and international awards, publications, lectures, and exhibitions are a, are a byproduct of their work and testify to their evolving design sensibilities. Amongst those talks is this talk today also. They are both alumni of the Sir J.J. College of Architecture and have completed their Master of Architecture degrees with, dis with distinction from the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. Pinkish has been a gold medalist at the University of Mumbai in 1992 and also attended the post-professional program and travel fellowship chaired by Dr. Charles Moore at the University of Texas at, at Austin. Pinkish is currently Dean Academic Affairs at the Kamla Raheja Vidyanidhi Institute of Architecture and Environmental Studies, where both Shilpa and he have been teaching since 2002. He also serves on the Board of Studies of Rachna Sansad Academy of Architecture in Mumbai. Shilpa is a co-opted member of the National Executive Council of the Institute of Indian Interior Designers since 2017. Welcome, Pinkish and Shilpa. Very good evening uh, to all on behalf uh, of the team at S Plus PSA, uh, Shilpa and myself. Uh, this talk, in a sense, is more than uh, three years overdue. Uh, Khushru has been chasing us uh, since we met at the 2016, I think, IIA Awards in Calicut and persistently thereafter every year. So we are very glad to finally make it happen, uh, especially through the kind of ages of uh, ASA. So thank you uh, AESA for inviting us. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today amongst lots of friends actually, familiar faces and many others uh, who have found the time to attend uh, our talk on a Saturday evening. Today we thought it may be relevant uh, to speak about our personal engagement over the last 20 years uh, with what dwelling and domesticity in the city means and especially how we as a practice have dealt with it directly through our work. The inner life of a dwelling is a scene of constant joy, tension, speculation and evolution in which the ideal of the family continues to stand at the core of this turbulence. Immersed in both practice and pedagogy, but more importantly living in Mumbai, forces us to confront some of the issues associated with both the real and the abstract. What we may have been unable to address in practice, we've had the opportunity to address in academia. But without doubt, the two have influenced and fed each other in one circular loop. Even though the practice has dealt with several other typologies from corporate offices, workshops, educational, institutional and public spaces. Today, for the sake of this presentation, we will focus on some of the residential work done at the studio. This opportunity has forced us to reflect and pick from a range of residential built work over the years at different scales. The sizes are of course reflective of the scales within the office and not in general. We will see a single room, the smallest project that we have designed for our smallest client, a young girl of nine years, three duplays for three nuclear families of about three to four persons, a semi-detached house for a multi-generational family ranging from one year to 90 years, and a group housing project for indeterminate clients. Broad themes emerge dominant for each project, but are in no way exclusive to that project alone but find overlaps with each other and our other work as well. Even though there may, be, there may have been other similar projects, these projects remain emblematic of some of the concerns that we see recurring over time at the practice. We hope you will enjoy what we have to share. Shulpa will just do the first uh, part of the presentation. Tonal differences always help be realized, so one doesn't get bored too much with one person. Uh, so I'll take you all through the first three uh, interior projects here. Uh, you want to 
so this is, as Pinkish said, the smallest project that we had. Uh, it was a tiny room, and given uh, the situation of Bombay, where space is always a limitation, certain things you will see always overlapped within our practice. Uh, things of how do you make a small thing look much larger than it is uh, through different uh, means of either layering, um, removing walls, changing spaces, multifunctional spaces, and st stuff like that. To an extent, somewhere where it's become part of our uh, uh, body language and our space making techniques, where even sometimes when we have all the space in the world, we're trying to still make, no, but how can you create more space? Um, so here uh, is a tiny project. Uh, so the family was growing. They had a child of, uh, who was growing and going to become a teenager soon. She wanted her own space. Of course, the house was of two bedrooms with uh, the uh, parents and the grandparents living there, and there was no space for her uh, by herself. Uh, but interestingly, it was on the top of a building, and it had a double shell uh, roof uh, with a height of 14 feet in the middle. So we just about managed to squeeze in a little box on top of the kitchen. The kitchen height was only seven feet. So we kind of placed a box uh, which was completely made off-site uh, and then made uh, on the site uh, in two days. That shows uh, it was a light uh, made, it was uh, made out of uh, polycarbonate, uh, wooden rafters, uh, rubber wood flooring, uh, plywood partitions. And the idea was just to make it as playful as possible for the little child and to make it as far as possible involving uh, her with the activities of the rest of the house. That just shows the construction uh, method. And uh, here it is showing her in different parts of it. Completely opens up and uh, becomes airy during the day. We also managed to add tuck in a little tiny staircase just on the side of the kitchen, which uh, takes you up to that level. And as you can see from the inside too, it's pretty uh, sufficient for a child with their own desk, a bed, a cupboard, and then of course all kinds of windows at different heights uh, to kind of change the scale of what, how you are re reacting to the rest of the house with. This is um, in Mumbai, um, near the R.A. Mill colony. Uh, so it has some fabulous views from up there. It's on the 48th and 49th floor of a building. Uh, more and more we are seeing uh, jobs that are coming in which are talking about living up, uh, up there. Uh, personally, both of us have always lived on the ground floor. So for us to deal with something that is uh, not on the ground floor, it's, it's a completely different experience if you all have ever been to these one of these high-rise apartments and seeing the way uh, the city unfolds in front of you uh, or your relationship with nature is very different. You're no longer within the branches of the tree either, you're just up there somewhere. And uh, in this one, we specifically realized it because in one of the first times when we visited the site, it was in the month of August, and uh, the rainy clouds were just there, they were gray, and uh, the, all the windows were opened. Uh, interestingly for us, it had 12 and 12 feet height per floor. So uh, there was also, uh, uh, the, the windows they felt loomy, and they kind of uh, just brought in the entire breeze and weather inside. And we saw some clouds floating in, and we decided at that point itself, let, let's do the house in a way that we don't restrict the clouds from moving in. As you can see in the plan, it's, uh, this is at the ground level. Uh, the original 48th floor, uh, the lower level rather. The staircase was actually tucked in here. This was the opening that was given. Another thing that happens to us with all these newer uh, buildings now is that uh, uh, we cannot really break any walls. Most of the walls now are sheer walls, and they cannot be touched. So we are working with new phenomena now in Mumbai. Uh, so the, the opening that was given was here. So we pulled out the staircase from here, and we brought it out, uh, because we have a strong belief that staircases form an absolute um, integral part of a house, uh, which kind of animate a space because there are people moving up and down, and you're bound to interact with family members. Uh, almost to a level that we have the power to make people of family meet or not meet sometimes. So um, the staircase was brought out, the dining was pushed here with a lovely uh, terrace. Okay, for us, even this is lovely. It's just seven feet, but we call it really lovely. Uh, so it's only seven feet wide like this, and I think about uh, 19 feet like this, uh, but it kind of extends the uh, dining into that space. 
uh, that's the entry. Uh, the living is here. And uh, these two were meant for the two sets of grandparents who might or might not live with them. And upstairs you have the master suite and the two daughters. Uh, since it was 12 feet height, uh, we just thought to break the stair somehow so that one does not feel the length too much. So one comes down and the kind of changes the mode in which you finally come down to the floor. Uh, the idea of not keeping restrictive spaces was by making the floor with the wall and the ceiling feel seamless. So we were trying to add as less joints and corners as possible in the house. And that's how you see a seamless floor. Uh, which can, becomes a wall, and then the wall, you don't see a corner up there, which becomes a softer ceiling. Of course, we can do all this because we had great heights. If we had the new uh, ways in which Mumbai apartments are done, which is like hardly nine feet slab to slab, sometimes or nine feet six slab to slab, that means you barely get eight feet ten or nine feet of height. Then I can't even dream of all this. But we were fortunate enough to get that kind of a space. This shows from the living room looking towards the dining, and one can see how it flows out over there. The staircase that goes up and forms the main element of the house. And the structure of the staircase becomes more than just supporting the staircase. Uh, it becomes sometimes a railing up there, and it becomes a frame of a door, or it takes over to allow the light to come down, or it becomes a place where these two members become a place for putting the um, track lights on it. Uh, we didn't, we've not touched the ceiling in that sense, kept it very clean. This is looking from the dining to the other side, and as you can see, the fabulous views of the RML colony and mountains. Who gets to see mountains in Mumbai otherwise? Sorry. Uh, as one goes up, that's the way you would then interact with the rest of the house. And here you can see the terrace and its relationship, and then, of course, buildings are soon going to come up. Uh, you feel you've got the best house, and suddenly within uh, a few months you realize, or a few years you realize, there's something, a tall building coming up and just 20 feet away from you. So that's sad stories that people bear sometimes. Uh, and then all these kind of uh, uh, methods are used so as to keep the entire house interactive with each other. So though, though there is a master bedroom here, but these doors kind of open so as to keep the conversations open between uh, various parts of the house. That's the master bedroom, where the same language of the floor becoming the bed base and everything continue. The master bedroom seen from the other side. The same wood is used all over the house. We've not changed things. Very singular language in that sense. Uh, and then this was a tiny room tucked away inside for one of the daughters, but being 12 feet and uh, she was, I think, 11 years old or something. And uh, we thought, why not create a, a sense of a loft space for her? So there was a loft and it behaved like a large cube. And then the cube started peeling off to become these different things. So this cube, it peeled off to become the stairs or it peeled off to become the loft or it peeled off to become the bed or the cupboard. Coming down again towards the dining. and then looking back again towards the house from the terrace, from the veranda. Lot of elements were also got, this is, uh, I'm doing the second house for them actually, these clients. So uh, some elements were got from their earlier house and retained and put back in this one too. This next house is in Khar, in the midst of a lot of uh, urban growth. As you can, uh, but again, it's a repeat client. Uh, sorry. Again, it's a repeat client. We had done a house for him in uh, Juhu at one point. Uh, he's a friend, he's a civil engineer, and uh, took great pride in his uh, workmanship of concrete. And uh, I remember even in this house, this was like a post extended house. So these were like, there were no columns within the house. All the columns were on the periphery, and this was a free plate. And we had kind of said, if it's free, how can we stop? How can we avoid feeling the grittiness of what typical apartments give us? And hence, we had added this concrete wall, which goes all the way like this in a curve. Uh, the flooring, as you can see, was in situ and not rectilinear. And there were always spaces that were looking beyond from one part to the other. 
Certain memories, as you will see in the photographs that unfold, uh, were carried forward from this house as memories of the older house as they went to the new one. So this is the apartment block. This is the kind of language uh, of the rest of the area around. And uh, we got involved with this project, of course, way earlier on. And uh, hence, we could uh, ask them to do certain changes if you wanted to. And uh, I'll show you how we ended up getting this kind of a double height. So in this part, uh, the lower floor, this was our part. It was, this is again a duplay, where this was on the lower level, on the ninth floor. And then on the 10th floor, it became the whole thing like this. Uh, we requested them to give us a cutout here and a cutout here. Uh, so that we get a double height in those areas. So that's the way in which that space basically looks where the flooring completely leaks into all these areas. But all these areas are not really within the house. The actual enclosed area is only this much and this is all the double height open to sky uh, or not open to sky, but double height. So at least you get some kind of uh, new relationships to the nature and the surrounding areas. Uh, there is a tendency in Mumbai to quickly go into your little old cubby hole and enclose your capsule and put on the ACs, close your blinds and curtains and uh, kind of live your own little life over there. Uh, but in all our projects, we make it sure that the houses really breathe um, and there is a sense of connection back to the nature in some form or the other. Oh no. The red lines over here show the enclosure of that of that space and this shows how that space can be completely opened up to allow elements of nature and views uh, right through the house where they don't hinder the views at all. The marked area now shows as much of open space and green that we could involve. And then the kind of flooring and everything shows how we've integrated that whole space to become one. So when you're inside, you don't really, you start um, eliminating the uh, consciousness of inside and outside. This shows, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back one step. So this entire space then was uh, wrapped in this wooden member to kind of give it more definition. And in this following slide, you can see how the member starts uh, cutting itself, peeling itself, uh, and making way for either functions or uh, the openness. It, in the last one, you'll see how the materiality also starts getting involved. So this is how uh, it eventually becomes where all those things that are seen, these are of course sharper lines, but they're actually uh, the way in which wood has been treated, which I will show in the following slides, to kind of uh, create a language for this entire space. But it's a wrap that goes like this and boxes itself around, and these two sides are open. Uh, this, the remaining space is this, and that's how it became called the pavilion house, uh, because that's the only space that is covered, which is the living room, and then everything else becomes open around it. Here you can see the joy and the love that's been poured into uh, the container where different uh, widths of wood were treated in different ways to kind of create uh, both the sense of uh, sensory and textural uh, feel. Uh, also, it helped uh, because it was double height. We finally had light coming in at a different angle inside the house as against how it would typically reach the inside. And uh, the color of the wood uh, and the texture both kind of really lit up when the light came in. This is how you would enter the house. Uh, you can see the wrapper over there. This is the entry. And then that wooden shell is right here, where this, of course, part has been peeled out from it. This uh, shows how all the openings that are there have been, uh, uh, whatever, have been slid away. And they are behind these walls. And they create complete openings to interact this inter inside space with this area outside in every way. And then, of course, the ad addition of foliage and green. Uh, also, a little notice to the ceiling over here. So as uh, he, we did that little thing in his earlier house with the concrete, even in this house, we did a little special thing uh, where 
Uh, this is not an add-on. Uh, the slab was actually cast like that, uh, where and it was a very very painful affair. But uh, just he enjoyed it and we enjoyed it. Oops. Here you can see how that was done. How for the farmers and we were actually hoping to leave the imprint of wood and all that on it, which didn't quite work, so we didn't do that. Uh, but here you can see how pieces of styrofoam were cut and in squares, cubes of four by four, then inserted and then the concrete poured into them. He wanted to do it. Uh, there is a stair which takes them up, and of course, uh, that being the primary space, this was a very light stair which, if you can see, it reduced in its section as it went up from here, and cantilever too. This is one of the outdoor spaces, uh, which was double height, uh, where there's a little bar outside. And then uh, the inclusion of greens in various forms, even from the floor. And because it's a rising system, then how we added these columns of green, uh, which were fabricated by us, uh, which feed from water above. And then they are fed in. And then there's a little collecting pool over here. But they're like columns of green that hang up and taking an eye up and also giving some kind of screening from the surrounding. This is the other volume which was cut off and was double high. So that's the upper room, uh, which uh, kind of uh, floats over the lower area. The dining slips out. There is a little pool with a statue of Dimpy, made by Dimpy men in over here. Here you can see the columns of green and the various ways in which uh, the green has been reincorporated. a little haven of green over there. So even the outdoor spaces, when you do come out, uh, become more than just a veranda with nothing. I mean, you, you, it's active space. You can be sitting, doing, sometimes in, sometimes out. And it's, of course, the whole distinguishing nature from inside to outside has been removed. So it feels like just one space coming out of that area. This is looking back at the staircase. And uh, there's a pichwai, uh, which was done by an artist. The entire pichwai was done by this artist. Details of the staircase, where it actually shows how the section keeps changing as it goes from uh, top to bottom. It is separated here at the landing, but of course tied up with a rod again. But it shows the integrity of the two staircases, which are currently going up and down. That's this. So one comes here, the other one goes there. And there is glass, of course, fit into this. So as one leaves the lower level and comes up to the upper level, you climb the staircase and you come here. Uh, this continues to be a master bedroom with a little balcony that they get to go outside. And that continues to be the double height on both sides. So this is that floating uh, thing which you see from below. That same room, when you enter it from the top, uh, continues the wooden story that began at the bottom, uh, including the floor also, which again uh, reiterates the memory of the 4 by 4 below by doing it in uh, open crane travertine. And that's coming out from the balcony at that master bedroom level, which can be used in various ways. Including a head in jacuzzi in there. And the interaction with the green in a different way uh, from this level. So the rest of the house here um, was made in such a way that all the enclosed areas, which is basically these pockets, uh, <coughs> took care of all the functions that were had to be enclosed by nature and led to a very staggered space, uh, which was then very interactive in nature. If this remained open, it's kind of all these spaces spoke to each other. That's how the enclosures of the utilities took place. And that's how there was a relationship between uh, different rooms. So it was never, so it was that one living room, the master bedroom, and then the rest of the spaces also all spoke with each other. This is the living room, uh, uh, the family room at the upper level. That shows the contain all the containers, of course, were covered in the same material. So this is one of those uh, utility containers. 
And then you can see what happens when it starts opening, you start having relationships with the rest of the spaces around. And uh, the sun's bed over here, you should, you should notice the bed moving, but also the background moving where it becomes covered sometimes, and then open, and then it opens into that family room sometimes. And, and the bed keeps turning around and making different relationships with the, both the room, the outside, and with the rest of the spaces inside the apartment. It's a self-contained thing which moves on a turntable uh, with its desk and bed rest and a little bench. It'll come back. Yeah. This was a guest bedroom up, and the, the this has been got back from their earlier house. We got it back here. And of course, a plethora of details which our office goes mad about, and we enjoy it a lot too. Okay. Uh, this third project uh, is also duplay. So there were three duplays, all we thought dealing with nature in their own way. Uh, as the first one was more about the clouds, the second one was uh, more about how do you involve the green to come back at on the ninth and tenth floor, and. Uh, this one, when we visited the site, was in this condition. Uh, the middle, uh, the, the, the slab between the two floors was, as you can see, removed and patched up and uh, very, uh, I mean, there were these extensions made very erratically over here. And uh, also, it was kind of not really uh, holding up well. It needed maintenance. So we thought of just removing that whole mess that was happening. That wasn't helping us one bit. And we ended up getting this kind of a space. So suddenly that slab in the middle went off. We removed a beam too, with the engineer's permission. And then this was uh, the large volume. And when we saw this volume, it was so gracious and so beautiful and so airy uh, that we saw how, do, how does one retain the sense of this uh, volume then? And the idea was to then create uh, any other space would become a volume within this volume, within the volume. And that's what we ended up doing. So as you can see, this is that larger volume. This was a suspended uh, bedroom that we put within that volume. And then there was another volume inside to take care of their uh, the closed functions of the bedroom. This is taken from the building across, actually, but just to demonstrate again how that singular volume reads. And then you have the secondary volume coming in here. And then there is a terrace on top, which I'll get to in the plans. No plans, is it? Okay. So this is the other uh, photograph. It shows the relationships between uh, the different levels, where you can come up from a staircase here, and then you would see below, and there is a terrace on this side, and then there's this volume which kind of floats, uh, suspended midair in the larger volume. It's a very, very simple plan, actually. That's a lower level living space. Two balconies, uh, both, I think, about five feet wide mm -hmm. uh, over here. And then uh, we've suspended this thing over here so that it touches one corner for the duct purposes, uh, narrows down as it comes towards the two ends, and bulges in the middle, and a staircase which leads you to that area. Uh, as far as the rest of the house goes, there's a daughter's uh, room here, a kitchen here, some utility spaces here and a terrace at the upper level here, and a guest room here. This is a closer view which starts demonstrating how that suspended thing has been uh, done and how the weight is taken by the extra beams that were put on top, which I'll get to in a moment. But it also shows how this entire uh, facade on each side has been dealt in a, uh, two similar kind of facades, both with glass and wood and then uh, just coming out and interacting with the terraces, the verandas. This is in the underbelly of that space. Uh, this form over here not only bulges downwards like this, but it's, it goes like this and it bulges downwards. So it's a very complex uh, two-way curve that happens. Integration of lighting also happens within it. Uh, the materially also, of course, the outer shell has one material of the brick which con uh, contains an entire outer volume, and then this MS uh, structure, which is the float, which happens in the middle. <coughs> the 
it shows how it comes and goes out actually into the balcony from the top area and the relationships of uh, within this uh, brick flooring also there's a little patch of wood kind of sewn in to indicate where the living area is. All other things go double height to again uh, keep showing, emphasizing the height of spaces. This shows uh, a little more detailed version of how we had those beams. We added our two eye beams over here. Then we added our stringers. And in those stringers, of course, there was a boarding and uh, boarding and the other members which filled in between the strangers and created that kind of space. That shows looking towards one of the things, just the hint of how one climbs up. And uh, to leave the integrity of that volume very clear, we also made the landing in glass so that the volume stands clear over here too. As one goes up, this is the bedroom, but uh, since it had uh, other buildings on the two ends of it, uh, this terrace was also uh, had to be made part of the interaction with this room. And then hence some windows and door openings were made over here so that there was interaction with the stairs. That's how they kind of opened up looking towards the terrace. The details made for those openings, uh, which range from six inch thickness coming down to almost two inches at the other end, uh, having insulation and of course because they were part of the other system, uh, it was a little tricky making them, but fun. As I said, most areas, other areas also always have a sense of interaction between the other spaces and uh, one never feels secluded in the houses that we've designed. Uh, some, some little glimpse of some other area which always does two things. One, it keeps interaction between different members alive and uh, secondly, creates a sense of layering and uh, largeness in the house. So here is when you would be in the dining room also, there's a little slit of a window which shows that something's going on in the kitchen. And this is the kind of landing which kind of comes out and becomes a little lily pool over here. That's a raw concrete staircase which goes up. Demonstrates the glass and looking at the other way. This is mainly to show the, the strips which are hanging, the raw metal uh, sheets, slightly curved inwards like this. This is taken from the uh, glass landing where one can again form relationships with the people sitting down and the terrace and the bedroom all together. But when one enters into the space, it is uh, warmer uh, with a singular birchwood material used, lighter, uh, not as raw and as heavy as the outer thing looks. And uh, this, is the, this is the third volume which is put within that volume. Uh, where we got a uh, Gond artist, uh, Venkat Shamji, to come and actually paint on it directly, and which encloses their walk in cupboard and which leads you inside into the toilet, where also the wooden, same wooden flooring continues and becomes a little deck kind of a thing over here to allow the shower water with a tray below it and stuff like that. And you can see how this volume also starts interacting with the toilet behind. Okay, the next three, I hope I haven't taken too much time, but we have three more projects to go. So I think uh, what Shulpa is showing, uh, even though uh, they're largely interior projects where uh, there's a lot of craft and a lot of kind of attention to material and detail, uh, the approach is kind of primarily uh, architectural and kind of we, that's why we kind of like calling it architectural interiors. Uh, it's about uh, how do you kind of spatially manipulate uh, experience uh, within kind of the spaces that you kind of handed over. And uh, I think some of these kind of uh, lessons, of course, learned there continue into the architectural projects. The architectural projects, of course, also influence uh, uh, 
the interior project so it's kind of uh, something that kind of feeds back and forth uh, between each other and it's kind of in- enjoyable for us we really uh, are able to enjoy interiors because it affords a scale at which we can operate which sometimes uh, architectural projects uh, don't allow you to do uh, <clears throat> so i mean in kind of a light of that uh, this is kind of uh, a house we did uh, several years back now called the collage house uh, i'm sure a lot of you must have kind of seen it heard about it in some sense um the kind of uh, approach we had to this was uh, looking at the idea of waste in india and uh, thinking about the point that uh, has kind of architecture does architecture have the ability to kind of take on some of the problems society faces and uh, you look at these figures i mean they're completely kind of mind blowing and uh, also the projections in terms of the future uh, so what can uh, architecture kind of really do can architecture really do anything about it in some sense and in india unfortunately waste is kind of seen uh, you know as a stigma people kind of see oh it's kind of got bad memories of something or it's got bad spirits it's uh, it's waste it's kind of all of that so how do you really kind of change this kind of perception that society uh, has uh, about waste and uh as we were kind of thinking about it i think uh, the kind of answer lay in the fact that uh, we really need to make a waste part of kind of cultural production in some sense and what does that really mean is that uh, if you have kind of uh, more films say kind of made about waste or you kind of have art produced about it or music or whatever uh, it begins to kind of uh, reframe the relationship that uh, society has with waste and uh the project essentially tries to uh, change uh the role architecture can have with waste uh, through that uh, relationship and this is actually nothing new it's uh, fairly common uh, in the west where uh, <clears throat> the idea of collage is actually and collage that is produced uh, from waste uh, been kind of fairly prevalent uh, for example uh, in 1958 you had this new york artist called louis nevelson who would walk the streets of new york pick up trash from dumpsters and she would come back and assemble these like really large kind of assemblages and she would paint them like black white gold or red or whatever i mean based on whatever she felt or the kind of boxes that joseph connell kind of would put together based on uh, memories of kind of past uh, homes or experiences people had or richard hamilton in the 50s and 60s basically so there is kind of a tradition of collage and kind of this idea of using waste and that's something we were really kind of tapping into um, in terms of the the kind of pr- uh, project itself uh, this is the kind of uh, context this is uh, in uh, navi mumbai in belapur uh, a kind of small little thing called parsik hill uh there's two little spurs like you can see and one spur is kind of pretty much filled out this is the second spur it's kind of next to the mayor's house a little red circle of course indicates uh, where the site is uh and you think oh wow we've got a site uh, on the top of the hill you're going to have these fantastic views and you can look out and unfortunately when we go there for the first time this is what is there you have a house on the right then you have a house on the left and there's something coming up right in front of us so this idea of kind of having these fantastic views out from the top of the hill were crushed i mean the very first time we kind of went there and what uh, it kind of really did in a sense is uh, immediately kind of gave us that response that we need to kind of look inward and to create this kind of uh, courtyard in the center and these are some of the earlier uh, kind of study models uh, which we had Uh, looking at that sense of a courtyard simple c shaped kind of house two wings with a connecting staircase and passage uh, with kind of the idea of shielding away the front a little bit uh, more so that uh, you're kind of uh, shielded a little bit from the house that's going to come right across you and uh, through that kind of work uh, what really developed was was this idea of a two story frame a frame that is able to kind of contain the shell of the house and uh, within which we could actually pretty much uh, you know put anything we want also you'll notice on the lower image is this idea of there's this kind of these flights which take you up and the center is actually kind of this uh, raised ground that happens so this is kind of an axonometric we did of uh, the kind of project and if you actually kind of you know dismantle the entire thing that the the middle portion is actually that concrete frame that holds all these disparate parts together and within which it's kind of a container of several kind of objects uh, which fill it 
uh, and we'll kind of see each of these kind of or some of these objects that occupy that frame in a while. So these were again some of the earlier uh, ideas uh, which we had, uh, which were presented to the client. The idea of recycling and how within the frame different kind of uh, things. So there was the idea of uh, the windows right at the front in the facade, the idea of using waste pipes or waste plates uh, and whatever else kind of uh, we could do in some sense. So this was kind of uh, very early, but as the project progressed, it kind of just took on kind of a life of its own in some sense. So this is the kind of uh, context. Uh, one minute. Oops. I think there's a small movie, but I think it's not working. Anyway, uh, so uh, this is the uh, front facade actually. Uh, earlier sketches indicated as kind of this uh, really I mean, if you see what was done on the model, it's kind of a carry forth of that, which was earlier very, very opaque. And here it kind of transforms to become uh, this kind of assemblage. But this is kind of what it's uh, turned out to be. Uh, very interesting process. Uh, we had a client who's completely kind of uh, bought in uh, to this whole idea. Uh, he runs a company which has firms all across the country. He put all his... Uh, staff across the country to find windows for him uh, till he realized that he didn't have to look very far and right in Mumbai uh, in Dotaki uh, there's this huge recycling kind of yard where all the kind of waste of Mumbai actually lands up there and uh, we did several trips to these yards uh, at Dotaki uh, discovered this one guy who had this fabulous collection of old uh, windows of Burma teak uh, picked these uh, individually, documented each one, photographed, drawn, uh, and then we kind of come back to the office and kind of begin to kind of uh, play with uh, them. So this is very uh, kind of strange and different for our kind of office where I mean, you, see, you saw some of the earlier drawings as well. As a practice, we tend to, and that's how we are taught, I mean, you tend to overdraw things and you kind of want everything in control and you kind of want that drawing to represent, you know, what that end product is. But here you couldn't really kind of get a handle on that uh, because there was so much ambiguity uh, and uh, space where you didn't know what to do. And it was uh, really wonderful that what we then devised is kind of a system to make this whole thing work. And it was actually the traditional carpenters who are uh, really used to working with traditional windows who are actually teaching us uh, what we could do or how we could kind of assemble or bring these things together. So I think there was a fabulous kind of learning for us or rather unlearning I would think uh, about how if you kind of open up kind of your process of or your method of working and you know allow other people and kind of influences to enter it can actually kind of enrich the process. So. Uh, there's actually a steel kind of frame that runs in the middle of each window, uh, which is in that third little kind of photograph. And the entire uh, uh, window is hung like a curtain wall, actually, in front of the slab. Uh, so this is actually what kind of ends up. And you can see this in the drawings. Uh, that section, actually, the wall section clearly shows you that, that there's a supporting framework. Uh, and then there is uh, each window, which is kind of individually fitted into that. And the remaining part is infilled with this kind of lightweight polycarbonate. Again, coming back from that first project of that uh, little girl's uh, room there. So it gives you this kind of very beautiful kind of, uh, you know, kind of quality of light that kind of it brings inside. Uh, this is the entrance. You come in through a car porch, uh, through this kind of blue door becomes kind of the sign uh, for the main door. The, the glass uh, drum is actually a puja space. Uh, where you can sit in and like uh, the window there, that slot is actually designed to be able to look out when you're sitting and there's a little kind of green kind of grow outside over there. And you come into a intentionally thin, long and kind of dark space, uh, which you see the suggestion of that staircase, which kind of draws you up. In that space, your first encounter is with this uh, kind of jali and uh, it's strange because it's uh, decorative, but it's still industrial. I mean, so it's got this kind of motif of Krishna right there and the other two are kind of images of Radha over there. So the, the client is uh, this believer of Krishna and the house is in fact called Kanha. 
and we were really looking at uh, how can you actually embed within the house uh, this kind of identity of the client in some way. Uh, this is of course uh, uh, part of that same jali on the kind of upper wall. So we, we thought what better place than to look at uh, Mathura which is kind of directly con connected to Krishna and the top left is actually motifs of which come out of Sanji paper art. So they have these beautiful craftsmen who do paper cuts and uh, those are the kind of paper cuts uh, that they make in Mathura in the Sanji art and we've actually taken those kind of motifs through several various iterations and kind of drawing and redrawing uh, to actually create these kind of panels. Uh, it's also, I mean, the idea of the lift with this jali, we've never understood why in somebody's personal house you need to move within like a completely walled-in box space, you know, why can't it be open to air and light and uh, again, nothing new if you go to old buildings in Fort, uh, I mean, most of these kind of lifts that were added uh, have these kind of uh, lift wells uh, which are there. So, I mean, working on multiple kind of influences uh, and creating that uh, kind of mesh enclosure for that entire lift. So you basically go up these kind of uh, staircases. Again, working at a time um, in Mumbai, I mean, even within our kind of practice, I think probably at that point, 15 years into the profession, we had begun to feel that, uh, especially in Mumbai, uh, even the kind of quality of craftsmen we were getting uh, at that point with building materials and crafts was rapidly fading. So uh, there's a strong emphasis on everything that's made by hand uh, in some sense. So it's like the exposed concrete uh, staircase, which of course there's a tradition in you know Ahmedabad, Delhi, maybe Pune as well, but really kind of uh, very difficult to do uh, in Mumbai. You know, then again the kind of uh, aggregate plaster, a lot of things. I mean, again trying to consciously bring back uh, you know methods which uh, use the hand as a very conscious tool to kind of create. So you come up into this kind of lobby and then the house kind of actually opens out and completely expo I mean explodes. It's filled with light from that really dark passage and then you come into this living room which is kind of you know fairly lofty uh, about 14 feet high here and then you actually see the uh, windows which you saw outside uh, actually uh, working inside. So each one can be opened uh, in fills of this wonderful uh, colored glass. There's a story to kind of every little element in this house. Uh, all that glass actually uh, comes from Dharavi. Uh, again, found by the client uh, who take us on the weekend when he was free. Uh, through several different shops, we've like picked up uh, whatever waste each one uh, had. Some really, you can't sense it here, but some really beautifully textured or fluted kind of colored glasses which were there. The hardware has another story. Uh, we were looking for, uh, you know, uh, hardware which would match some of these old uh, doors and windows. Couldn't find something very kind of uh, appropriate. Uh, the client then through his kind of ramblings uh, discovered a fellow in uh, Chor Bazaar actually who had not the handles itself but the molds uh, for kind of old handles. So we kind of got these specially kind of cast. For. These are not things we asked for, you know, this is... The client just kind of got obsessed at some level with what was going on and it just became uh, his passion, you know, I mean, in some sense. So a lot of this is kind of feeding back from the client, you know, not entirely through us. You'll also notice uh, on the top, actually, and maybe in some of the other photographs, the ceiling is actually uh, faceted uh, in concrete. Uh, the left, of course, opens up to the courtyard. Yeah, here, this is probably a better view. Uh, the cl the engineer wanted a kind of uh, ripped slab and we kind of just uh, faceted that and some of that uh, diagonal kind of uh, geometry gets picked up onto that floor which is again uh, uh, inlaid in brass. Uh, it's like a, quite a crazy pla uh, pattern if you ask me but this one kadia from Rajasthan like took I think 30 days or 40 days to just do this entire work. I mean absolutely brilliantly done. I mean... Uh, in the age where you can kind of laser cut and you know CNC route and all of that I mean we have these skills which are uh, you know inherent in uh, kind of the manpower we have so I mean it was just amazing to tap into this kind of pool. Uh, again a lot of other recycles so the, the wall on the right is actually uh, waste uh, strips stone strips uh, generated partly from our own site of course we didn't get uh, all of it on site 
so we would go to the back of the stone yards if you go to the back of any person selling marble and slabs you'd find all their waste dumped over there and we kind of picked all of that and it was kind of cut uh, into these kind of strips and kind of put together into that whole double height wall so you come into this courtyard so the courtyard is actually on the first floor and uh, quite a surprise in that sense and that opens up to the sky uh, but below that courtyard is actually a, a rainwater harvesting tank so it actually harvests all the water from the roof it brings it down through those pipes you can see some of those spouts behind that colored tile wall and it's actually channelized uh, so the bench which you see is actually designed because there are four kind of uh, tanks and the wood is actually meant to disguise those manhole covers and it would go from like a sand bed to a charcoal bed and all of that and collects the entire thing uh, within uh, rather under the courtyard in some sense <clears throat> so a very kind of intricately uh, woven uh, water system as well uh, there's also a small little lap pool which is there i think uh, you know our clients tend to have uh, needs and desires which sometimes you know fight our kind of uh, goals of sustainability or being eco friendly but i think one has to kind of you know think of them as a positive to see how one can really uh, work a system that can allow them some of those kind of aspirations to kind of come true so that's yeah the left actually has a small little tiny little lap pool which overflows to kind of become a little pool there <coughs> the uh, the metal clad wall is again uh, done from waste as is the pipe wall people think because it's grey it's pvc it's actually all metal uh, kalamboli is very close by so uh, we had a lot of kind of waste uh, that was picked up and that's all strapped together with uh, you know these metal straps which kind of gives it that look of bamboo these are some of those uh, you can actually see the prints of so we had things scrap metal from belgium and all kinds of places that has kind of come together into that wall uh this is the crazy powder room which is our contemporary version of uh, the shish mahal actually uh, all sides three walls and the ceiling is covered by a uh, small kind of uh, off cuts of mirror Uh, the only thing we've done is uh, we made sure they all fit into one another, but uh, each of the edges is actually beveled as well. Uh, so it kind of gives you this quite a crazy feeling actually. But everybody seems to enjoy it uh, whenever they're there. And of course, there's this funky kind of pink pipe which uh, brings all the other elements that are needed in that toilet. So whether it's a light, a toilet paper holder, a napkin rod, whatever, just kind of comes together in that. master bedroom uh, on one side of the uh, house as you can see the floor plates are really thin so two sided full height windows plenty of light you can manipulate the light and uh, visibility as you desire again like we mentioned the uh, joint family uh, four generations living together so the ability to relate to each other can really be controlled how you kind of you know uh, deal with the windows in some sense the bed back uh sorry is uh, actually uh, simple moldings which you use for picture frames just kind of put diagonally again as a response to uh, the faceted ceiling on top simple kind of trick used kind of fairly ready made kind of things which are there. and here again this is like a little uh, desk come storage next to the pool all the wood here uh, again i must mention is uh, bought from uh, same place in dotaki uh, it was kind of quite horrifying over the few days we were there is like really large kind of uh, rafters of wood really chunky sections coming in there and as we are watching them they are cutting these massive sections down into smaller pieces because they don't have place to kind of store that large section of wood within their go down i mean so all the wood uh, is actually from there uh, all burma teak uh, really old uh, we actually got it cut in like four different widths it's all tongue and grooved and kind of fits together into the house this is again one of the clients uh, kind of indulgences i mean found a guy who was shutting down a shop 
uh, of printing blocks bought i think some 400 500 of these cut it together and we've kind of assembled this into the son's bedroom here and here again you can see the layering across the house i mean you can you can really be in touch with the rest of the family if you want or just kind of screen off and this is kind of the the effect we desired when nature begins to kind of take over and kind of slowly slowly you know engulfs the entire house so that's where you can really make out that tank over there and uh, the site was actually sloping over here so this is about uh, i think 3 4 feet uh, above this kind of level here so what we've really done is that this level becomes the same and this is a regular 10 feet but that difference of 4 feet actually ends up giving you a larger volume in the uh, living room basically uh and there's a small kind of pavilion which i'll get to in a second the other thing i want to just kind of notice is this kind of tank because again a uh, kind of interesting story about you know opening yourself up to and listening to kind of people uh so this is a slab that was meant to be flat and uh, uh we we were on a site visit one day with a structural engineer and uh, the slab was not cast and this beautiful view in the afternoon this beautiful light coming down all the way to the ground floor the sun and it's kind of just lighting up that ground floor and rajiv who was a structural engineer is like telling me that pinkesh you have to do something we must have a skylight above and i just kind of brushed him off saying that uh, rajiv not possible because we have tons of utilities on top there's a water tank and there's a place for a solar uh, heater there and there's a ac machine there's lots of utilities on the top and uh, i said no 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 not happening forget about it this that and everything and this is the engineer telling me it's normally the other way around so uh, so i kind of go back and spend a sleepless night like you know there's something right in what you're saying and there's something just magical about that experience that we had and uh, i mean went back to the drawing board in the morning and you know managed to get a crack i mean it was just about getting the light in you know in some sense so we've kind of done this small little crack at the top is just 18 inches wide and then we developed in some sort of a flat ceiling this kind of curved ceiling and uh, as you can see it's actually made out of uh, fabric the entire concrete is kind of cast in fabric uh, so it leaves these uh, wonderful kind of wrinkles and marks you know on that and you can see some of the so it's actually tarpaulin of a really thick gauge which is propped with uh, ms rods over there and you get this kind of look at the sun beating on that creases i mean at least we kind of love this kind of stuff so again about kind of when the light hits it and really kind of uh, you know makes that pop out in some sense so we're really trying to kind of one is get the light in but along with that like what can you do to the kind of surface that the light falls on you know yeah as shilpa was mentioning lots of kind of details too many to get into honestly at this stage uh, uh lots and lots of uh ways that kind of the whole house comes together this is the rear uh faces south so relatively opaque and we have this kind of uh, screen of uh, uh mundas which you use as props so some of them not all of them uh, come out of that actually and uh, have kind of been reused here and then you begin to see that little pavilion on the top so we have this little bit of spare fsi left uh, and the client is no no you must consume it i don't want to leave it for later and we really didn't want to kind of extend the house up and uh, we said what can you do what can you do and we kind of said what what if you just look at it as a completely different thing that you know is kind of sitting on top in some sense and that's really what it ended up being a uh, 110 year old columns from uh, cochin solid wood granite bases Uh, so the columns work uh, structurally here they're bolted to a concrete pedestal uh, with bolts through the granite and on the top there is a ms uh, rod which is the columns which are again bolted to the solid wood over which there is kind of a steel roof uh, for this entire thing so quite i mean the house is full of experiments of course uh, and it creates this really kind of uh, light and kind of floating a thing and this is actually where you finally begin to enjoy the views outward because at lower level you don't get and it's kind of become this uh, wonderful place where they all kind of all their friends and family everybody wants to be up here you know in the evenings so besides uh, kind of a lot of the single family houses we do uh, some of which you see in some which you haven't but 
uh, we also do a lot of interiors like we showed even smaller apartments and all of that but what's really interesting for us is uh, and this is kind of some kind of informal research which is going on in the office that if you strip away uh, you know the materials the kind of forms and all of that that you do and if you look at the the real kind of house type and uh, if you see what we were given what changes we've made and how we've kind of transformed it we've actually noticed that nobody wants to live in a house that is identical to somebody else's because each family is different each family has their own likes dislikes the structure is different the need for spaces is different so it's actually something which really uh, i mean homes don't need to be so cookie cutter they actually need to have this kind of flexibility where uh, they can adapt to different kind of people and people should kind of need to have choice about this and that's something that really directly influenced uh, the housing project which we've done in lonavla So if you look at housing today uh, you get these two kind of opposites uh, you get the formal sector which is creating these kind of uh, cookie cutter houses absolutely identical repetitive one after the other whereas you get on the other side informal settlements which are highly personalized and of course not always by choice but they take what they have at hand and kind of you know develop a dwelling for themselves so i mean living in the city today especially in india seems to kind of oscillate between these kind of really kind of two extremes and what have people really done to kind of uh, bring in this kind of individuality and there are many many approaches one is this kind of uh, do it yourself you take something that's available and you kind of you know hack it you transform it like this typical ikea cupboard which becomes something else or you kind of just personalize it we also live in an age where everything from your car to your denims can actually be made uh, customized for you i mean uh, this is happening all around people can uh, you know take advantages of these things which uh, products are actually offering you even industrial or product designers are now moving away from the fact uh, of a completely identical product to looking at how industrial processes can also leave their mark Uh, on products so that every product is slightly different similarly you have the idea of crowd sourcing like this is a font that is crowd sourced from several people across the world or you have the idea of open source where people can actually you know plug and play and keep kind of developing their own things so i mean the question really was that you know can we do something about it and i think architects are normally always like a generation or so behind you know i mean the society has moved ahead but we are kind of still stuck behind in some sense so we were just thinking that can we actually address some of these concerns in some way so we started uh, this from the smallest kind of house size that we had which was like a 40 square meter unit simple 3.5 by 10 meter thing with a 3 meter height is what we started with and he said what if you actually raise that height to 4.5 meters and what that really immediately does is allows you to occupy another level like a small loft or something within and that came from a simple observation one is from some of the buildings on site the top left is one of the existing buildings on the site which had this kind of tall space of course the british knew what to do i mean it's like lofty height the hot air would rise and escape but also if you look at really small settlements like the informal settlements or even chawls where you have more height the simplest thing you do is you vol- use volume when you don't have square footage you have cubic footage and you actually add that little loft to create some more space and we said to this combination what if you really just add a small kind of little garden that everybody has this kind of extension into nature in some sense so through this very simple logic we develop this whole kind of uh, size where there are actually five sizes of houses that you can actually have and for example type a which is 40 square meters has four different types again and similarly the 60 square meters has two types and you begin to have like lots of multiple kind of choices that people could actually choose from and all this however is driven by a modularity so everything uses that 3.5 meter wide uh, tube uh, as a kind of strict kind of a decider between you know every kind of space that's created so there's a certain modularity in built and of course that came from our earlier thoughts very initially in the project about kind of you know doing this off site of kind of mass producing but of course the volume of the project was not enough to allow us to do that but it is kind of structured by that but we said is this enough i mean is this really all we can do or is there something we can do more and we developed this kind of uh, matrix of uh, various options so 
you could really uh, choose from different things. You could choose the size of the house, then you could choose the layout of the house that you want, and then you had a multiple amount of choices. You could choose the type of window you like, what color the window is, there are screens in the front because the thing is high, there's a terrace, there's a railing, there's a kind of garden that you have, there's an internal staircase which takes you to the loft, the flooring and the toilet tile and so on and so forth. So you could really kind of develop this idea of uh, your own unit and it becomes kind of personal to you in some sense. And we suggested doing this kind of app to the client. Unfortunately, that kind of didn't happen. But uh, it's interesting because people could really have played around and created this kind of uh, home for themselves. So you're picking kind of your railing and you're picking and immediately it's kind of reflecting in the kind of drawing or the graphic what uh, it would look like and you had to pick a stair and it would show up and you could play around till you kind of you know got that the right combination that you like so the site uh, like i mentioned is in lonavla uh, that's the mumbai pune expressway uh, it's situated touching the tracks right there the red is actually the station and this is right at uh, the railway crossing which is there which you can see on the top photograph the trains actually passing by there beautiful site old parsi sanatorium with some very mature trees the the kind of site at the rear is about a meter and a half up really tried to save all those houses uh, fought with the client a lot didn't manage it uh, managed to conserve those three at the right side which i'll kind of show you a little bit later so we took this very simple unit uh, you know and kept doing a series of operations to them it grows an arm it comes together it forms a courtyard it becomes a street we break it open uh, shift it around to accommodate side to allow for trees which are there so the units could shift back and forth to accommodate those trees take it flip it on the top and again move it back and forth so that you created terraces so that everybody got a garden so everybody at the back has a garden everybody in the front on the terraces begins to have a garden here and the gaps are actually bridged across and they add additional rooms to the upper floor so like what is typically a 1 bhk could become like a 2 bhk over there and this is all kind of uh, connected up by these uh, external walk up staircases grounded again by these kind of little stone walls at the level of the site that's the track that's the crossing we started with a simple uh, building as a gateway over here uh, which you enter through uh, there's a little buffer which the client insisted on we pushed the buildings back because he was worried things on the tracks would not sell uh, so you enter and you basically create the street like i just explained uh, the way it happens uh, these are the three buildings we managed to save and around that becomes like a community center a pool and multi purpose hall and all of that stuff the red is actually the raised kind of platform uh, at the end which is about a meter and a half higher around that you have another set of homes which come together and then there are three large kind of villas uh, which are there which open out into this kind of public space so you have a variety of types basically across the entire site everybody has their own kind of personal space but there's also a balance of public space which is all kind of almost interconnected across the entire site uh, vehicular circulation but also a range of multiple kind of pathways that pedestrians could take through the whole project and that's really what kind of uh, finally emerges and uh, that's kind of the section over there and you'll notice at the end it begins to kind of rise up uh, to become that central garden and then the site actually dropped away at the end so even the 2 and 3 bhk rooms uh, continue to have that uh, 14 feet height of the living room essentially So that's uh, the project as completed. Uh, that's the entrance building. So these are two levels of uh, banquet halls. On uh, the right side is shops below, offices above. You enter through this kind of darwaza building, uh, which takes you to the back. We've kind of pulled out the staircases, so you see this kind of movement of people for the ceremonial kind of functions. That's the hall itself. shops at the upper level and that's kind of the the housing that actually uh, begins so at at kind of mid uh, street level we connected this across with a pergola here 
you can see the the bridge units on the right side which actually the bottoms are completely open uh, and they lead to these little pockets which are like uh, uh, for children to play in uh, most of the units are entered through these little porches uh, each one is kind of slightly different uh, which allows you to have direct access from outside and a lot of these walk up staircases and you can see like uh, the language of the railings and all that keeps changing and there's a concrete wood steel metal and all kinds of different things and people have begun to actually take over and personalize uh, the units as well so i think yeah this shows that kind of uh, range of different window types and colors and the screens and everything but it's all contained by that logic of the tube in some sense and at the end of the street you terminate with this kind of again double height uh, pergola which kind of happens and it kind of closes that whole sequence of the street some of these upper level kind of gardens which start overlooking each other so that's uh, a loft uh, on top so it could be used for different things uh, people have really really adapted it it's actually one of our uh, kind of things we want to do is to go and uh, actually document the kind of variety of things people have done with it because uh, there's amazing kind of uh, variety which is there uh, what we've done is we made sure every loft has uh, one window at least directly so if you do enclose it you have an external face for ventilation if not two sometimes uh, and the gardens uh, like you can see are kind of flowing out from the unit itself so these are some of the other two types this is with a spiral where the kitchen is in the middle and open and you can see the tube actually opens out with that loft and that's the straight flight everybody of course has a garden so this is the rear part uh, near the pool deck these are the larger uh, villas there and this is the uh, larger green the central green at the back i must uh, mention the landscaping is done by roots uh, umesh and Par prachi from pune in fact uh, and the, those are the three buildings we actually managed to uh, save at the back we'll get to those in just a minute yeah, so that's actually the we call it the veranda which is the kind of community center that's the condition it was in three separate kind of uh, blocks beautiful uh, simple very simple buildings and uh, that's what it's kind of been transformed into so those were the three units uh, which you can see at the top uh, first thing we did is we connected all three of them with this addition of this uh, concrete volume which becomes the connector repeated the exact same size once more uh, because there was a group of trees in the middle so you couldn't extend it directly uh, which becomes kind of a multi-purpose hall took the veranda that is existing and extruded it around which connected all the four blocks together and then off that becomes the whole kind of pool deck and amphitheater which kind of comes together so if you look at these in section uh, the existing condition there's a load bearing wall right in the middle very close stable two parts kind of actually becoming separate and we wanted large open spaces so we actually done some structural kind of juggler we opened up the center in the middle so it creates a bigger uh, space one of them we've added a loft across as well and the last one what we've done the new volume that we've done is we've taken the same profile and just flipped it uh, 180 degrees so what is actually kind of stable just kind of becomes like an upward uh, sloping roof and you'll see uh, it, it kind of just changes the entire space because uh, it fills that space with uh, light and kind of completely makes that uh, extrovert from being very introvert. Slices through the building. Uh, that's the uh, older part and how it relates to the pool deck and the pool and the playground kind of beyond. The second section is through the connector which is rectangular, very low height and only when you sit are you able to actually look out and establish kind of those relationships. And the last one, of course, is the the new edition of the blog. That's what uh, kind of happens. So the first one is a multi-purpose hall. The second one is a indoor games room. The middle is a lounge with a reading loft on top. Uh, steam sauna in the middle with changing rooms. And then there's a gym on the left. And that little small building is for utilities and services. 
so this is actually trying to uh, both kind of explain the project but also uh, bits of the structural kind of uh, jugglery which has been done i can actually maybe show you that on the photographs also so that's what it looks like uh, that simple line of the roof actually begins to just kind of tie everything up together it's this kind of continuous veranda all the uh, stone pedestals the wood the rafters the plinth all came out of the existing buildings that were actually dismantled all of it has been reused even uh, some of the wood which has gone bad was all actually reused from the existing buildings uh, which kind of came down so that's the courtyard between the old and the new so this is at the end where you kind of get a built in seat right at the end uh, overlooking that courtyard and that's a kind of new loft which we've added so here you can see that uh, the old truss is there but we've added a steel member uh, across so there's actually two new columns which have been erected with a steel beam on top uh, from which this is actually hung from where uh, the uh, trusses are actually bolted to the new steel members so that's the new loft with the lounge Again, you can see a little bit of the heritage style. We actually earlier wanted to do all of it in that. Uh, didn't have a budget. Uh, so, I mean, you wanted to use it in some way. So we've kind of done these uh, really random patches, which look like it's like, you know, the sun's just streaming through those openings and kind of bringing alive what was there earlier in some sense. So that's the kind of row of rooms on that. Some of the other wet areas. That's the gym. Again, you can see that larger steel beam which is added to open up this entire space into a singular space. And that's the new building with that amphitheater at the end. This is from inside. You can see it's very, very different spatially, right? It completely opens up to the trees. There's light coming in. And also the two large doors we designed. So you get this very kind of diagonal connection to the pool deck. I think, do we have time? Are we done now? I have, I think stop. So this is actually uh, recent, I think it's kind of very hot. Uh, everybody knows about probably, this is uh, the Satara kind of uh, municipal council competition that was recently held. Just our entry for that. Uh, it's called uh, People's Place. Uh, that's kind of the project uh, which we uh, had submitted. Uh, we were basically looking at, uh, I mean, if you look at the constitution, it's we the people, that's how it starts. And uh, public buildings or government buildings uh, are always referred to as kind of government funded, but it's actually taxpayer funded and uh, it's our money and uh, they really never do anything for the people. And I think the primary kind of thing that was driving the project was uh, how can you actually create a place that you can give back to the people in some sense so it becomes kind of a people's place even when it's not being used uh, for the function it's kind of meant for in some sense but simultaneously riding with that idea was this uh, kind of interesting uh, what's called the ladder of citizen participation which was done in 69 by uh, sherry einstein the psychologist who's looking at how do you uh, ch if you want to change governance uh, you really have to start involving people to participate and that there are seven layers to this. Uh, you start from manipulation. I think that's what we are in right now. I mean, seeing the news that's been happening all day today, we're all being grossly manipulated right now. So, I mean, we have a lot kind of to climb up there. I mean, so you have to go from, you know, stages of non-participation to where there's a token kind of participation. Did you finally begin to kind of citizens can actually begin to kind of control what's really going on and what does that really mean in terms of space and how you kind of design you know in some sense uh, we were also looking at uh, local kind of examples uh, that are there uh, one is of course uh, Ajinkya Tara which is kind of the fort which is really kind of famous in Satara also uh, things like the Shetra Maoli temple with its guards and all of that but also this idea of uh, early examples of governance actually happening uh, under a Shamyana you know simple kind of cloth this fabric under which people gather and uh, you can actually uh, you know begin to have a dialogue and exchange basically and that's really what drove the project these three kind of strands in some sense 
the top one if you look at is the idea like i mentioned of providing shade uh, that canopy is actually manipulated till kind of one part is kind of really raised up to acknowledge the views towards ajinkya tara on that side uh, and then if you see the uh, entire series on the left is actually looking at this idea of uh, uh, climbing a mountain like if you go to ajinkya tara you actually ascending the mountain so how do you actually climb up towards uh, that mountain and what it really does in this case is it takes people from the ground from the street all the way to the top uh, through which you can see that diagonal kind of blue funnel which actually opens up uh, views towards ajinkya tara from the top and then of course the two kind of arms of the building which are really the support of the building uh, and the kind of administrative support uh, which uh, provides kind of the city and that is also kind of articulated a little bit along the edges so that's kind of a site plan very simple kind of uh, rectangular building uh, so it actually kind of comes right as the steps actually cascade right down to the ground and slowly take you through these kind of various levels and the top of course uh, is kind of the council chamber uh, at the top so if you see the plan uh, i'm not going to get too much into it but uh, so that's the steps which kind of lead you and this is kind of entire diagonal kind of orientation uh, within the building which in a sense tries to acknowledge that kind of diagonal uh, view of ajinkya tara from that side so i mean you keep seeing it through every floor till you actually then discover it you know on the top floor we also uh, added these functions of a children civic library and uh, some multi purpose halls which can be used for citizen interaction so along that red line everything below is completely public and the above is actually kind of secure for office functions so the idea again like i was mentioning that how can people keep kind of coming here and uh, as it steps up uh, every platform it's actually a tiered space uh, as you go up uh, the center of the building which is actually deeper uh, is completely uh, holding all the storage i mean there is immense amount of records and storage rooms uh, which are required and uh, we actually put all that in the middle so that uh, you know you can actually even if you get less light it's kind of okay but at every level you are able to connect both the arms of the building really thin just 12 meters wide so you can look right across get good light and ventilation and what we've done is staggered the core so you can actually break these into smaller neighborhoods of a small office a medium large office so based on the requirements uh, of each department you could actually choose uh, where that can happen and you can basically take this climb right across the building here and then you go back so on the on the second last floor here uh, there's actually a fitness center there's a restaurant over here Uh, with a kitchen uh, which could spill out onto this so the idea was that uh, even though you can shut these wings off at night the place here could actually if possible remain open and then you reach on the top floor and the wall actually moves away and you're actually able to look out to ajinkya that's it's a full kind of terrace space uh, at the top completely open to public so the central space can actually completely open out and the top floor it of course connects back and the chamber and everything is there we actually even grouped uh, the programs uh, based on like uh, departments that actually kind of go together like welfare and infrastructure and we've arranged them in the building so uh, things that need more interaction with the public actually on the lower floors and the upper floors then actually become more and more kind of uh, vip areas so we went back yes yeah, so that's actually the section of the building there's a big basement you climb up from here that's the steps that take you so every this ramps which take you or staircases uh right across till you reach that kind of top spot over there and this is complete interaction from the top to the kind of street level <coughs> yeah so all these terraces actually become this kind of people's place which is open in some sense 24/7 people can actually use it as a place to meet hang out and uh, the idea of course is that over time that uh, the public and the government uh, government people could actually begin to kind of spill out and use these platforms as kind of opportunities for exchange and interaction here and of course the the sides uh, reflect that kind of cascading kind of quality this is the kind of last uh, 
bay where you can look out towards Ajinkya Tha. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Pinkish amazing work here. Thank you. And as always, when two people work together, uh, the uh, it obviously begs the question: How do you divide your work? <laughs> And uh, how many fights do you have? <laughs> this is always the first question we always ask at every lecture we give. <laughs> no, I think it's also interesting uh, for people who work together. So I think when we started, uh, we should do everything together. Till we realized that uh, both clients and contractors just took you for a ride because it was like, "Look, madam, ne to ye bola tha, and saaf ne to ye bola tha." And you know, they they're playing. Uh, you off each other in some sense. Um, so we kind of very quickly realized that that's really not the way to kind of do this. Um, so now each one is in a sense uh, running each project, but uh, we know exactly what's going on on all the projects. So we will sit and have discussions, fights, like you said, severe fights about things, uh, but. The veto is kind of with the person running that project, you know, and uh, <clears throat> it's been very interesting because uh, I think I'm a little stuck up. Shilpa is far more free, uh, so like I would have opposed things, which you realize that once it's done, it's like wow, this works fabulously, and like why didn't I think of this? So I think it it's allowed us to kind of work off each other and uh, you know always discuss things. Uh, but it's also given space for uh, individual kind of growth and freedom for each one as a kind of individual professional to, you know, actually find their own kind of ways of doing things. So I think what holds us is some of these kind of core values. I mean, I think that's kind of uncompromisable. I mean, and whether it's her, me, whatever, we start with some things which are kind of fundamental, you know, in some sense. So I think that's really what is kind of the mainstay. Yeah, but lots of fights. So, Shilpa, you want to? No, but I, I think one would add that the journey for both of us has been pretty similar. So that helps because our uh, our track record is similar. Yeah. So that helps. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
things varying where the act of aging is a pleasurable act not something you see as a defect uh, which makes you choose certain things obviously i mean so over time the palette has tended to become more natural more indian uh, materials and all of that but we've also realized people's aspirations have to do with a little bit of kind of they want like finished if that's kind of the word to use it's not always like that but i think they're consciously also undermining the palette by introducing something which is raw or will age and will show marks of time or whatever on you know in that kind of experience of the space in some sense so yeah i don't think there's a formula i don't know if i answered that i don't know if i want to add anything to that i think you wanted to also say that so it's not that the interiors were made the architecture was by him Yeah, yeah, like that in all. office at all. You wouldn't even know which one. I wouldn't even tell you which one was his. Yeah, which one was mine. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but that is. You didn't mention which year it was. What happened? So it's. it's a good yeah, these are actually all mixed up. So yeah. it's not even chronological. So that is something interestingly. In fact, um, one of my older clients, whom I'm again working for just now, the first house was done by me in 2002, and if you see that house today, they still believe. I mean, it's like so the houses don't age, and I think one uh, interesting reason is because you keep true to your materials. Right. And the light and the ventilation. I think these two, three things. If you do, I think the houses don't age that. Yeah. When I say vintage, I mean it uh, naturally uh, is dated because you can refer to the time. But here, I'm just trying to see it differently. It's like it's timeless in a way, but it has got that uh, yeah, very subtle quality, you know, yeah. about I mean, it. I like uh, the word yeah. use of like a lived-in quality. I mean, that's yes, more yes. what I and think one would be kind of aspiring yeah, that, to. Yeah, that's available on a day one, and yeah. which is wonderful. Yeah. You know? I mean, but it also ages. I mean, I, yes. I don't think it's simulated in that sense. It's not like yeah, you know yeah. Disneyland or like it's not like a theme restaurant in that sense. It's real and it will age more. But yeah, I think they do. I mean, we kind of I think try to have that kind of lived in feel. The, the the homes are always warm and kind of. Uh, I think if sense, you, you know? if you like those things, you'll some of your personality comes into the projects also. Yeah, so I, I think that's the, that's yeah, the yeah. another so that leads me to another uh, question how do you stop because there are so Good many question. ideas so many <laughs> so many materials so many details right. because not do something not to do something is also very uh, very much Absolutely. a design decision great question uh, and uh, how do you decide to stop one thing you're very mean to our clients sometimes we say no <laughs> half the time is just no so um, saying the no is very important because they don't know and they are like latest kya hai and like trendy kya hai types and we just have to keep saying no to them But I also and think we are very strict. We are very strict when it comes to work. But I, I think the the I think more importantly the internal conversation. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'll tell you both on collage house and uh, the housing project uh, design. I why uh, there was a time when Shilpa was like just losing it. It's like, please stop. This is enough. You know, you can't keep doing kind of more and more of this kind of thing. And uh, so. I think whilst one was enjoying, one was doing and trying to kind of take it to its limit. Uh, there was a so I think that's what works. Right? There's two people. It's like a balancing act. There's somebody to kind of really pull you back. Ki abhi bhot hua. It's like band karo. You know what I mean? So I think we've had these conversations about like this kind of multitude of you know the windows and the colors and like how mad can you get? You know and I think we were looking consciously for that kind of diversity and the mix. And you know at collage house the The number of elements that kind of are there, like where do you stop? You know, I mean, uh, I don't know where, what the right I don't kind think of. I think we've stopped. We yeah. have one over board. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Shilpa strongly believes we have. I mean, that you we could have done a few things less. You know, but what's life? You know, without making some mistakes, I mean, you learn from all these things actually. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, amazing work. Uh, I have a slightly related question to what Madhav asked. You know, it's. It's very difficult to say no to clients. You know, it takes a lot of courage, and a lot of work that I saw from small, medium, large, extra large. You know, the whole trajectory of work is amazing, but the common thread is that there is a consistency of sincere detailing and meticulous work. So how how do you you know? I'm sure you spend a lot of time in client education because you have Absolutely. to right. take the client on your side. and that's the most difficult part and sure, at the yeah. same time the contractors because right. there's a every time something new has to be done i'm sure you also get frustrated with shortcuts right
So how do you, you know, get those things? I, I, I'm sure it's yeah. very painstaking, but we I just wanted to. I, I, I also think that it's, uh, it's uh, poor clients actually, you know, sometimes because they don't see, it's all in our heads. We know exactly how the, what the outcome is going to be, but they don't. And they just have to go by trust, unfortunately. So uh, they don't know what's happening till it all comes up. Yeah. And the date actually works is when a neighbor or a friend comes in and says, Kya bana hai? <laughs> then, then it's the greatest chance. You know? so, I think what's really helped us uh, in this whole thing is to actually, I mean, like how do you build trust, right? I mean, I think yeah. that's what I think is really interesting about your question is, uh, we've learned and we were accused several times also of being very slow at what we do, okay? Mm. Uh, obviously, like you mentioned, it takes time, I mean, to do this. Uh, so, we've started involving the clients into our process. So, we almost like have a weekly meeting and uh, so clients don't feel that we are wasting time on some other project, we are not working on it. So we are actually sharing everything that we are doing, whether it's sketches, we are making models, we are you know doing mock-ups or whatever it is, is shared on a regular basis with them. So I think what has happened is over time they begin to kind of trust you that okay these guys are not faffing around, they are doing something and the kind of energy, passion they're showing in what they're doing, they must be knowing what they're doing and passion at works. some point they, we works. see that they begin to kind of withdraw, you know, and they actually let it go and they let it kind of take on. But, uh, so it's a two-way process and like you rightly said, we have to educate, it's our responsibility. We can't say that they should understand and they will understand. We have to take the pains to do it and the only way uh, we found is to be honest and transparent in your dealings with them that you're trying to explain every concept and why were you trying to do what you were trying to do and mm -hmm. sometimes you've had issues that saying no that's horrible we don't like it and you know it forces us to go back to the drawing board and find another concept but that relationship is an important one I mean to get anything close to this stuff built you know. I think also I think academia has helped us articulate ourselves a little bit better. So we can actually explain to them why is behind the things you know. So, so I think beyond the trust what you're saying it is the engaging them in the process as yes. a part of a dialogue rather than a monologue. Absolutely. I think that, that must be helping a lot. Uh, so it's not this kind of, you know, heroic architect who comes and mm -hmm. ko sketch karna. it's not mm -hmm. like that. I mean, and uh, these, I mean, we're showing them as kind of end products, but they have gone through several kind of stages of changes and things like that, you know. But uh, again, it's uh, about, like Shulpa is very rightly saying, uh, explaining to them why you're doing what, which means I have to either make an extra model or another conceptual sketch or a diagram, which, you know, is able to simplify this for them, you know, in simple drawing, simple model, simple language and make them understand why are we doing what we are doing, you know. Yeah. So I think that is really helped build uh, this kind of relationship and trust. The why is important. Very, very important. <laughs> Honestly, what's also good is it's forced us to clarify for ourselves why are we doing this? You know, if you can explain it, uh, like they say to your grandmother over a phone call in your native language, if you can do that, you can, you know, then explain it to your client. I mean, it's you have to be able to reduce it to such simple things. Actually, I remember the time when uh, I was trying to explain a shadow joint to somebody. Where two materials meet and how important it is to leave a shadow joint. And these clients get completely fat. I mean, like, wow, somebody's thinking so deep, so kuch achai karte hoon, you know? so. uh, All these things you have to fix in a certain time limit, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah of we, course. But we do take time for projects, yeah. So we are very small practice in that sense. We enjoy the work we do, but we do take time. Yeah, but I, I mean, any, any work that has so much detailing needs time. Yeah, so we say bye to a lot of projects. We but also people who come with us with time limits and yeah we are kind of catering to them and at some point they will say okay thik hai, thoda jada time laega, to thik hai. you know I mean like, aap karo hai. so I know it becomes like that as well I mean, but yeah I mean uh, we've not shown offices today we do a lot of offices and all which are very kind of driven by time and kind of budgets and all of that so yeah I mean we do and can do those things as well you know Thank you so much for the presentation and uh, I mean I was just exposed to probably just a couple of your works and so from the small right up to the large I could see a, a sequence of works spread over multiple years I presume. So in my mind I was making a kind of a word map you know of mm -hmm. what represents S plus PSA sort of thing so like law 14 feet tons of wood uh, <laughs> you know, uh, simplicity of uh, simplicity of you know kind of uh, making materials work and kind of wrap rap you like you, you you use the word rap a lot 
and then you did collage house and it went absolutely bonkers yeah. uh, so i you know I, I'm, I'm sure it has lots of elements that you had but then i said okay so this is also them uh, so uh, lots of little mixed uh, yeah. burning neurons in my brain right now so out of all the works that you presented uh, you've also traveled the journey over this last uh, couple of decades at this moment of time which work properly properly uh, represents your one work if you had to select represents what you are the most which would it be <laughs> i'm just you know i'm no, just no no each work comes with its own passion i don't think it's I'm, a i'm not I questioning think as passion much as man. you say that the collage just... house looks very different than the other kind of things we've done but i think the ethos is there and in fact the beauty of the project was that we learned a new way of doing things where uh, it had to be collaborative in nature and i think it was so uh, and we are learners because of academia we just learn also i mean that's it. but uh, i mean i think to answer your question um, a little more than that uh, the collage house in some sense uh, it may not be our kind of favorite work i think probably the the next project no we should say is probably uh, more uh, what may be what we may really like been. <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, i think collage house uh, for example uh, was a serious kind of questioning of things that uh, we had you know as architects taken for granted uh, things that we were schooled in uh, which we thought were the ways to do things but i think because like shilpa singh because we are involved in academia it's made us question a lot of things that we were taught uh, so a lot of that is consciously trying to dismantle things which uh, you know we would have done over some of the project show as you know what would be the natural kind of way to do things in some sense uh so i'm not sure and that's why i say it's that whole project for us is learnings you know i mean learnings at different scales and at different levels of uh, uh, approaching problems in that sense uh but uh, yeah i don't know what more i can say <laughs> i think uh, all your experimentations and doing this and that and uh, collage and that culminated into the, uh, that is what my feeling culminated into your uh, uh, lona wala project which is architecture also and interior also and that shows experimental experimentation also that gives you to have some variations also i think that is the complete uh, outcome of your what you are doing in var various different uh, Uh, and projects. like you mentioned like you right i mean that you know everything is influencing each other the things going on parallelly in the office and you know you are bouncing kind of thoughts between things so yeah things do affect each other so sir you are doing a fantastic work uh, yeah. just wanted to ask from a engineer side point of view yeah. that uh, it's a very foolish actually question whether you give estimate to your client <laughs> of course tell because me the, because the way in which you are working yeah. and the wood you are using uh, the cost uh, <coughs> means whether the cost is a factor or not in the project of course it is i mean tell me which client today is going to let us work without cost you know i mean uh, no it's very much there it's, i think it's a process uh, one has to go uh, through like i said uh, the aim is always to get them to buy into the bigger idea once they have done that then they are willing to kind of you know kind of do things which you are asking for and uh, of course it's not always the first thing that we may have proposed i mean they will tell us no and will push us back to the drawing board and but i think then what begins to happen is you're working collectively that okay we buy into the idea we want to save this but what are the forms can it take you know and that uh, so that makes you work harder to save the idea as well and kind of them pushing you that no no this is like it can't be you know that thick of wood and it has to be made thin or whatever i mean whether it's wood or some other thing i mean so many many things which are there but yeah i mean i think cost is important of course it's important i mean i also think cost is important because uh, i mean it, this looks kind of extravagant but as a country we need to be conscious of how we kind of uh, allocate resources you know for things so i think from both points of views it's important to think about cost so pinkish yeah so i have a question connected to the same question yes. so what was the budget given for this collage house because that 
like so you said you know it is all from the waste so right. did you really save i mean what was the no, budget no so that's again a, another question we kind of get asked a lot uh, so no it's not cost us any less uh, if i have to be completely honest about it because uh, what uh, you saved in material in some sense uh, you actually spent on labor because it is highly labor intensive it's needed you to rework a lot of those materials to kind of actually be used so i wouldn't say it's cheap i mean but it's pretty much cost on average what you know house like that would have cost but it's not cheaper by a fast rate i will be kind of completely honest about that so yeah so uh, can you shed some light on your um, your presence at site your and shilpa's presence at site in site visits because it, it's in, intensely involved uh, detailing yeah i'm sure you have had uh, if you say no to the clients i'm sure you said no and no race to infinity to a lot of contractors and made them do things all over again <laughs> uh so uh, yeah two ways to kind of answer that uh, one is uh, we do a lot of drawing like i said so the idea of i mean we've had students who uh, worked with us or people are working with us actually telling us that why are we drawing so much when on site you know they are not looking at half your drawing so the simple answer we have is first is for us to understand ourselves what we are doing you know so one is you do a lot of drawings to uh, understand for yourself those drawings are of course then shared on site uh, we have developed for the interior projects of course a group of people who we work with consistently uh, who have understood us what we small time kind of artisans doing fantastic work understand now very well but uh, of course because of clients we work with you know several people uh, who are not part of these teams so it it takes that initial about a month or so for them to understand what is intended the fact that we will not compromise on certain things certain things have to be done a certain way and at the end of it all we tell them a simple thing ki lekin drawing mein kya hai drawing mein jo hai wo karo so it's not me you liking it not liking it just follow the drawing you know i mean and i think that has helped us kind of get out of some of these things uh, you know far kind of uh, easier in some sense so Uh, Actually, going to site is in some sense a formality. Drawings uh, yeah. are so intensive that um, it can. Yeah, so nice even and just blind eye say, look at the drawing. So even in interiors. uh we never gone on site and done a drawing on the wall we actually kind of dislike that whole kind of attitude to the profession i mean you have to take yourself or your profession far more seriously uh so we actually even till today right from the beginning of our practice we don't go to site more than once a week uh for the interior projects uh it doesn't need more than that according to us because there is enough so what we are actually going is to just kind of uh, trouble shoot like acha aapko kuch karne mein takleef kya hai where is the site hurdle or whatever you know i mean so you are just doing that i mean otherwise things kind of tend to flow honestly fairly smoothly i think i mean it's not so much of a also problem for details we don't take no for an answer we said kuch to way hoga let's figure it out but no we go in fact uh, i think we've encountered uh, contractors now of course these are small enterprising uh, you know people you find in india who now like love a challenge thrown to them if you give them something simple it's like saab kuch karo ya madam ye kya aisa saada kya i mean so and a lot of this detailing is not visible to the naked eye you know it it just disappears eventually i mean we know what has happened but it just disappears so but i think they in- enjoy those challenges i, I think which is what i was going back to that we have an amazing set of resource people in india which just need to be tapped into you know we need to find these people and then they will do amazing things for you you know i mean so yeah pinkish yeah. uh there's this very curious uh, thing that i observed and i've been thinking about it for long uh, now you're talking, you're talking about crafts you're talking about labor centric uh, work i can see that extensive labor centric work in your and drawings as well i mean they are yeah. quite quite meticulously done uh, at the same time uh, the speed of the development around that you one sees and one is talking about variety of precast things ready made things to be installed kind of things so on one hand you can you see a practice which is growing fast where the time is the most crucial element of investment and on the other side as you are rightly saying that you take time you indulge into development of a craft or a detail and 
make the contact. So how, how do you see these things coming together? Because many times, especially when the students are around, uh, the practice and the education and the world around is pushing to saying that, okay, let's do and finish and get yeah, away. Yeah. It has to be ready next day. Right. And on the other side, the efforts that one can see and, and they are not necessarily following exactly what happened 100 years back in the crafts. I think you are right. reinventing, you are detailing it out. So how do you see the practice going, not not about only yours, right. but generally as an architecture? Scene? I think uh, it's the nature of the project and I think what the project demands. I mean, uh, we are working on a project which is a larger housing project for like a thousand units where you can't indulge yourself in doing things like this. You know, we are looking at kind of mass produced things, we are looking at precast, we are looking at off-site, I mean, so I think every project, every site has its demands and you have to find what is right, you know, for that in some sense. So the struggle on that project for us is that how are we able to bring that kind of imprint on the hand in some way, even in something which is say going to be like that, you know, I mean, so uh, I don't think that this is the only way to do it. I think yeah. the these projects with these clients on those sites allowed us to do it. But I don't think we say it as this is the way to practice or the only way to practice. A different challenge, a different project, you know, will demand us to rise to the occasion, hopefully not become, uh, you know, I would say falsely romantic about some of these kinds of things. And I think you have to be kind of aware and alert about the demands of the project at hand, you know, I mean, these are small at whatever, eventually they're small projects which allow a certain amount of indulgence, if I may call it so, you know, I mean, but yeah, I mean, we are also thinking of, as the scales of project shifts, we are looking at newer ways to address this. So. Yeah. yeah, because my question is about something uh, more deeper. What I'm trying to say is, see, practices, architectural practices are cursed with two types. One is that you have a person of specific practice. Mm -hmm and the person dies or no more there and the, the entire uh, philosophy of the practice dies with him. Right. And the other side we are seeing that large practices coming up which are almost like faceless. Right. Uh, the ideology is not visible maybe. And to continue with an idea, right. how do you see because you are also uh, involved in academics as well as uh, very extensive practice, how do you see yourself uh, dealing with this idea that some things which we believe in have to be transferred eventually and maybe as a practice as an example and theory resulting from that practice through academia. Right. So do you see that your practice and your thinking methods or working methods influence the way you teach or the vice versa? Definitely uh, has worked both ways. I think I like we mentioned earlier also that it's kind of a feedback loop that feeds each other you know I mean we have uh, very strongly been influenced by our teaching and what should I mention learning actually through the teaching is where we are teaching to learn in some sense uh, and like I said to dismantle a lot of things we learned for example with you all in JJ to try and relook at like you know does today's society yeah. today's time really need or demand us to do what we were taught say 25 years back you know and uh, and sometimes what happens is that your mind has understood that this is what needs to be done but your hand is still drawing the same way because it has got so used to that kind of culture of working you know in that particular way so it's a struggle i mean in that sense and uh, of course some of these questions get carried back into kind of student projects in terms of how you frame questions differently for them you know i mean uh, yeah so it is kind of very much so yeah but uh, it's, it's interesting uh, you talk about these kind of two practices. Uh, I don't know if there's a there's an alternate to that. I mean, which is more uh, like a process based practice in some sense. I mean, which no, no. is not kind of reliant on these two extremes. I mean, and I, I think a lot of young practices across the world, even in India today, I think are finding uh, you know in betweens. I think. I mean, I think that uh, the idea of these two extremes is kind of slowly kind of dismantling away in some sense. So. I also think uh, as long as you don't uh, start, as long as you don't start a project only with saying or giving up on trying to do more. Mm. I think at least it has to begin with trying to do as much as it will because at the end of the day, we don't dream who will. Yeah. And True. Uh, True. we have to dream. Let it get chopped off at the, as the project goes on. 
but we have to give it first. If we only start without putting it, there is no chopping to be done. I mean, <laughs> nobody even knows what's going on in our heads. True, true, very true. Any of your projects done with uh, catering process? Uh, yes, I mean, not the residential maybe as much, but uh, it's very strange. Some of these, uh, like some of our early projects, which we didn't show, uh, actually the residential projects have actually had project managers also on them. So uh, we've learned some good practices actually because of our experiences as well. Uh, the residential not so much, but a lot of the other work we do, of course, goes through all of those things, you know, I mean, yeah. And uh, like the housing project, uh, of course, had a full-fledged uh, team from the client side of like an engineering team. So, yeah, I mean, you need to provide all the services we normally expect, you know, out of a professional architect, I mean. So thanks all of you. Uh, it's been really wonderful because uh, we never get so many questions and great questions at that. So it's yeah wonderful audience because I think the interaction is what we crave more, more than just kind of going and showing our work. So thanks for really, really participating.